Today we're going to discuss what I shoot my YouTube videos with, which does vary greatly, considering I'm currently shooting on an FS7 with a cheap plastic fantastic lens so that I can show you the other gear that I usually shoot on, but I will show you the gear that is my go-to for filming my YouTube videos. And before we begin, all the information about the equipment I am using in this video will be linked in the description down below, which you can go check out for yourself. The first thing I'm going to talk about is my Sony a7R, which uh, is a little bit of a beast. I got the a7R Mark II because I didn't really have the funds to fork out for an a7R Mark III, uh, but you know what? Uh, judging by the difference between them both, I'm actually quite happy that I got this one at a cheaper value. Not not only is it an excellent pair to the FS7, that means I can use it on my regular filming jobs if I have any that require a smaller bodied camera, let's just say for gimbal work, which I'll get into later, but also it's just a really solid camera and I do like to use it for photography as well. Some would say that 42 megapixels is overkill and it probably is. One of the things I don't like about it and what I don't like about Sony in general is the colour science behind it. Skin tones are just that little bit too difficult or too much effort to, to fix sometimes, and sometimes you just need to rush through. Skin tones on a Sony are passable, but they're not amazing. But in saying that, that is quite a common thing for people to say about the Sony. It is still a fantastic camera and its low light capabilities are ace. I don't think I'll upgrade this one anytime soon. It actually is a really good camera, despite the 8-bit being a little bit of a pain to color grade. Who really cares, to be honest? This is just for YouTube, really, and I can still use it in other productions where I do need a compact camera for a gimbal, so that's a bonus there as well. Next up, the lens that is on this beast. The reason why this thing is so freaking heavy, the 24-70 GM 2.8, and uh, I love it. I mostly love it because it feels very solid. I also don't love it because it costs me an arm and a leg, but also <laughs> in saying that it is a really fast, very accurate lens. The autofocusing on it is superb. I mean, pairing a native lens with its camera is always going to get you a good result, but I am very, very pleased with this purchase. It's also got a very clean look. It's very clinical. So you can actually take this in post and, and fix it up any way you like instead of being stuck to a particular look of a lens. So in that way, it's really easy to manipulate it. What I really don't like about it is this fly-by-wire electronic focus. Not a fan. As with all stills lenses, they are a, a continuous roll on that focus ring. I wouldn't recommend using it if you're going to have a focus puller, they're gonna have a tough time. Also, it seems to pull very quickly from one number to another, so really keep an eye out on that if you're trying to do a focus pull yourself. It can very quickly catch up on you. One thing I did want to touch on here is do I like shooting EF? Clearly, I'm using an EF lens right now. I, I do like the flexibility of shooting EF mount lenses because you can use them on most camera types, even up to a RED and an Alexa. There are mounts that you can attach to those cameras to use Canon lenses, EF lenses. So you can put stills lenses on such an expensive camera. Why would you really, if you've got the money to spend on a camera like that? Maybe you've bought the camera, but you don't have enough money to buy a set of lenses and you'd rather just rent the lenses it's a good option for you. Even though the autofocus on this is amazing, and of course having a native lens to your camera is a good idea, it's still probably a better idea to still invest in some EF lenses so that you have that flexibility if you do decide to change camera systems, like I am very soon, except for this one. This one's staying with me. And if you're worried about only having one E-mount lens or only having one lens in your kit, there's a surprising amount that you can get away with when using one lens. It makes you really think hard about your framing and, and how you're gonna shoot a subject. And then you can just hire lenses as well. It's no big issue if you don't have everything in your kit, you can still hire. So the next thing I wanna talk about is filters. So I've got quite a number of filters here. First up, let's talk about the polarizer. I reckon that's a must for any kit. I use this for any outdoor shoots. If I need to shoot something that has the sky in it and I want a little bit more contrast in my image, I'll use one of these. Uh, considering I've only got one lens, I only need one thread size as well, which is pretty handy. Just be aware if you are going to use step up or step down rings, 
you may potentially have a little bit of light leak and your image might be a little bit more faded than it would when you just have one filter on there. If you haven't seen my video about filters, I'll link that one above for you. These filters should look familiar to you if you have seen that video. I have the Gobe, Gobe, Gobe. If anybody from Gobe, Gobe, is watching this video, please tell me how to pronounce it. I really quite like these filters. I am gonna be working on a comparison video, just trying to get my hands on some different types of filters to show you a comparison between these ones and different brands at different price points. But regardless, these are a really good budget-friendly brand. This one's pretty much a base set, so I've got a ND8, ND1000, and ND64. So a good mix to have. With the FS7, it has built-in ND, so I don't really need to worry with that too much. But uh, with something like the A7R, it's, it's something handy to have if you want to open up a little bit more and, and get that sweet drop-off. This one I won't be able to link in the description, unfortunately, because it is quite old and I found it in an old kit of my dad's. And it's um, just a little prism, which is really cool. I like to stick that in the corners of the lens to, to kind of get a little bit of light refraction and like I'm shooting through something. You can also use it kind of like a kaleidoscope, I guess. I'll show you now. Self and looking at the monitor and looking at this. I can't really sit back far enough to get it, but you get the point, right? Pretty funky. But yeah, that's pretty cool. Let's get on to the tripods and the support. I have quite a few different ways of setting up my camera. First up, I do have one of those stereotypical YouTuber bendy tripods. I bought this quite a while ago when I was traveling in Canada and uh, I needed something to set up my camera because I was traveling by myself and I wanted to take photos of myself. So this was my solution and um, it's come in handy in all of those years that I've had it. Not only can you use it as kind of like an extension arm so you can film yourself at a distance and get that angle so the camera is facing directly at you but also you can strap it to posts uh, set it up on the ground set it up on uneven ground you can also use it as handles for your camera if you want to get a little bit more stabilization I also have this cool little tripod here which is called the Manfrotto pixie I got this because I wanted to see if I could use it to set my phone up on it and I can I've got a little attachment for my phone that I can clip onto there but also I use it for a GoPro too which I'll get to in just a moment so I pop the GoPro on there using an adapter and I can set that down wherever I like I like this tripod because it's compact it's easy to use and it's just got a little ball head that you can adjust but yeah I think that was a really good purchase another tripod I have is the Manfrotto 190 I use that for my mirrorless camera to set up for most of my YouTube videos. Right now I'm on my Benro, and if you wanna see that review, I will link that one up above as well. I tend to use the Manfrotto most of the time because I'm mostly shooting on that A7R. But I really do like this tripod because it can be set up very easily. It's very light. I can use it as a monopod and also it has the ability to have a 90 degree arm so you can pop the arm out and then overhang it so you can do flat lays or if you want to just get the camera overhead to view something which i've used a few times on this channel i have found that infinitely handy this is the newbie to the family this is the gopro hero 7 i just got this one for christmas which was a an amazing christmas present thank you santa i've been having a lot of fun with this it's uh, a very very handy camera to have as like a, a third angle or even just to have something compact that i can throw in my bag and quickly pull it out and grab a shot instead of having to set up the a7r or if the a7r is in use still and the stabilization oh my god they sold me on the stabilization I was kind of turned off with GoPro for quite a while. The last one I used was a Hero 3, and to be honest with you, it was a piece of crap. So let's have a talk about sound. So I use a couple of different methods for sound. First up, if I'm on the go and I don't have the ability to attach a lapel mic, I tend to use my Rode Video Mic Plus, and that one just attaches to the top of the camera, which makes things really easy and attaches using the audio jack and and it's really straightforward. The battery in it lasts forever. I really do love it. But if I want slightly crisper audio or slightly cleaner audio, I tend to use a lapel mic. So I've got a Sony wireless pack that I use and I can attach that to both my FS7 and the A7R. So that is my first go-to for sound. 
because it does give me a better audio because it is so close to me. Now let's move on to lighting. So as you can see here, I don't use a hell of a lot of lighting and as a DP, I tend to hire my lights with a gaffer or hire them myself and hire the gaffer separately, whatever. I only have two lights really. I have the Westcott Solix with Apollo Orb, which I've spoken about on this channel quite a few times. I do love this. It's an alternative to the Aperture 130, 120D, whatever Peter McKinnon uses, but I really do like this light. I'm actually very happy that I got this light instead of the Aperture. The Aperture just was a tiny bit out of my price range and Westcott had a sale on when I went and purchased this and I'm very, very happy with the purchase. This light is perfectly daylight balanced and I love it, it's so versatile. And then in the background there, I have a LED panel, but it's not that amazing. It's good for what it's doing right now. It's doing some highlight work. It's just pretty much lighting up my background, but if it's gonna be used as a main light and you're using it next to the Westcott, it's so green. It's never gonna look right. Unless you put some minus green on there, it's, it's never gonna look right, so. Just be aware that if you are purchasing anything LED, just make sure that the color science behind it is going to be properly balanced. Otherwise you'll just have a bad time, especially if you're going in and color grading it. The next thing I wanna talk about, which probably should have been done with the tripods, is the Ronin S. I own a Ronin S and I use it with my A7R Mark II. I do like this combination. It's such a beautiful gimbal. It's really easy to use, really easy to set up compared to most gimbals out there. And I believe that it has the best capacity out of all the gimbals I've seen on the market. Now, correct me if I'm wrong there, but right now it seems to be topping its game. Obviously, I'm not including the bigger gimbals that are designed for much heavier cameras. I'm talking about the compact range. So things like the Crane and the Crane 2 and the Ronin, everything that's in that package of things, the Ronin seems to come out on top. It also has a lot more functionality in terms of getting cool different moves like the infinite spin and all of that stuff, which is so much fun. I've seen a lot of people saying that the Ronin is just really heavy. I don't know, maybe it's because I've worked with heavier cameras and I just see it as much lighter. I'm like, this is incredible. Like I'm so used to lugging around the FS7, lugging around an Alexa or a Red that having something so small and compact and able to just carry my mirrorless camera is is a godsend to my arms i i don't know <laughs> so the last thing i want to talk about is how i store all of my footage well not all of it the stuff that i'm working on the things that i need access to all the time and that would be on a samsung one terabyte ssd this is a godsend i absolutely love working off this drive it's just so quick and if you don't want to store things on your laptop or on your computer and you just want to have everything externally an ssd is probably a great way to go especially if you're able to utilize the usb-c cable they provide it is a usb-c drive but they do have a cable that is usb-c to usb3 if you don't have that sort of connection it also costs a bloody fortune but totally worth it and maybe in the future SSDs will actually become a little bit more affordable bags I didn't talk about bags at all I have a bag problem I have a lot of bags I have a lot of baggage I have a lot of bags I also have a cat okay a bag problem isn't actually a terrible problem to have to be honest it just means I've got a bag for almost every occasion and um, even then, I do find occasions where I do need a slightly different bag that I do not have. The bag I mainly use though is the Lowepro 350AW2. It is a really good bag for traveling with. It has very individualized compartments which you can switch around and change up to depend on what you've got in your kit. It's also carry-on size, so you can just take that onto an airplane without a problem. I love this bag. It's got so many cool compartments in it that it keeps everything really organized and very safe and padded. It also fits really nicely on my shoulders. I'm quite petite and bony, so bags don't really fit me too well. And this bag 
it's nice and I don't feel uncomfortable wearing it for long periods of time. I also have a smaller low pro bag which I use for other occasions but if I'm going out and about I'll tend to use this larger low pro. So thank you very much for watching this video today. I hope you got something out of it and if you are looking for any extra gear or setting up your own YouTube kit I'll leave the links for everything down below so you can have a look at what I use personally and see if maybe that's something that you would use as well. And if you like this video please remember to give it a big fat thumbs up and if you would like to see more of my face and learn a little bit more about filmmaking in the process remember to subscribe and I'll see you next Sunday.